Number 1. In a rundown apartment house, located in a bleak part of Hollywood, the mystery of Ronnie Chasen's murder deepened Wednesday night when a man police say they believe was connected to the publicist's killing shot himself around 5.30 p.m. as officers got ready to serve a search warrant. Neighbors said the man's first name was Harold. A few hours after the shooting, Kevin McClure from the Los Angeles Police Robbery Homicide Division appeared before reporters. He said that at 5.30 p.m., the Hollywood Division had received a call from the Beverly Hills Police Department, saying they were going to attempt to talk to someone at the Harvey Apartments. When they went to his residence, he pulled out a handgun and shot himself, McClure said, adding that the man was pronounced dead on the scene. There was blood all over the floor, and it looked like brain matter, said Terry Gilpin, a neighbor, speaking of the scene in the lobby last night. Though speculation Wednesday night was that Harold was Caucasian, which fit into some of the more elaborate Russian murder plot conspiracy theories floating around, multiple sources told the Daily Beast Thursday that he was African American. Neighbors' descriptions of him ran counter to a portrait of a man who could carry out the Chasen murder, which has confounded police. On Thursday morning, a neighbor told the Daily Beast's Claire Martin that Harold had said he was a two-strike felon and had told this neighbor, who did not want to be named, I messed up, shortly after the Chasen shooting. Robin Lyle, a second neighbor, who works at a Cadillac dealership, confirmed to the Daily Beast on Thursday that Harold had talked about receiving some money and had been waiting for $10,000, but that when it came it was much less, around $2,000. Tony Lee of the Beverly Hills Police Department described the man as a person of interest only and corrected himself when he used the word suspect. He added that the Chasen investigation is ongoing. Lyle said that Harold, whose last name he believed was Smith, had a stutter and rode a beach cruiser. He had no car that Lyle knew of. Harold, he said, wore gray gardening gloves whenever he went out, he said it was for his protection. Lyle described him as African American six foot three, with a thin build and a short afro. He was a mellow guy, always pleasant. He blinked a lot. He said he'd been in jail a couple of times. The anonymous neighbor said he thought Harold had been evicted, but came back to the building, using a key he'd copied from when he lived here. He lived in room 329 here. He was calm, the neighbor said, but every once in a while he would get agitated and say, have the cops been here, have the cops been here? How the man might be linked to Chasen's murder is not yet clear. Four law enforcement sources told the Los Angeles Times that he was indeed a suspect, but police would not give a name of the man or even confirm that he was a suspect. Tony Lee of the Beverly Hills Police Department described him as a person of interest only and corrected himself when he used the word suspect. He added that the Chasen investigation is ongoing. But according to a local news report, the Beverly Hills police say they believe the man who killed himself is the man who shot Chasen and that they had him under surveillance for several days. According to that report, the man shot himself in the lobby of the Harvey Apartments, outside the manager's office. Eddie Burke and Eddie Burke Jr., a father and his son who have been staying at the Harvey Apartments for the past two weeks, while Eddie Jr. embarks on a boxing career said the building is a transient building with studios and small apartments in the $600-$700 range. Earlier, the Beverly Hills Police Department had issued a statement saying, at the time of the shooting, BHPD detectives were on scene conducting a follow-up investigation. There were no other injuries related to the incident. Due to the fact that this is an ongoing investigation, there are no further details available at this time. Chasen a well-known Hollywood publicist who represented a number of A-list stars and filmmakers, including the late Natalie Wood and Jaws producer Richard Zanuck, was gunned down around midnight last month near her house in a quiet, affluent part of Beverly Hills after attending the premiere of the movie Burlesque. She was found slumped over the wheel in her Mercedes coupe, which had crashed into a telephone pole. According to a leaked coroner's report, Chasen's killer fired at least four shots into her car, including at least one hollow point bullet. At least one former detective believes that the killer was an expert marksman, according to ABC News. Normally they turn the gun sideways, and this is something that was done with some skill, said Gil Carrillo, a former homicide detective who worked in Los Angeles for more than 20 years. 
I carried a gun for 38 years and had to fire it quarterly. I don't think that I could shoot and hit that mass like that. The murder baffled her friends and clients and attracted widespread media attention. And the Beverly Hills Police Department dedicated almost half of its homicide investigation team to solve the publicist's murder. While police have remained tight-lipped about their investigation, theories about the murder have been abundant. Shortly after Chasen's killing, Sergeant Lincoln Hashino of the Beverly Hills Police Department said that the department had served search warrants on Chasen's home and office, looking for clues. It is an extremely unusual crime for us, he said. We don't have a crime like this on a regular basis. We are in the infancy stages of the investigation. He went on to say that the police were conducting a forensic examination of Chasen's vehicle and that, though a motive is not yet clear, it is unlikely, if someone is driving down the road, you can shoot them five times in the chest. He suggested that the driver most likely walked up to Chasen and began shooting. Investigators later told the Daily Beast that her purse had not been taken. Number 2. Peter Ivers had an act for the odd and the curious. A gifted musician, the Harvard alum had friends in high places, including Harold Ramis, David Lynch, and John Belushi. The Illinois native moved around during his formative years. With an ill father who eventually died, his mother married a businessman from Boston, where the family would end up. After attending Harvard University, he chose to pursue music and began playing the harmonica in the band, Street Choir. He would later open for Fleetwood Mac as they toured rumors. Peter had begun a solo career at the end of the 60s with the release of Night of the Blue Communion. The album presented a strange mix of musical variants and featured Yalin Bavan. As a review on Amazon claims, there's nothing else like it. In 1974, Peter signed a record deal with Warner Bros through his friend Van Dyke Parks, and two years later, his old friend David Lynch asked him to write a song for his new movie, Eraserhead. After writing The Haunting in Heaven, Peter scored Grand Theft Auto for Ron Howard. In an interview with The Washington Post, screenwriter Josh Frank explained why Peter Ivers was so important to Hollywood. He was the centerpiece of the wheel that our pop culture history turned around in the 1970s and 1980s. Even though his output didn't necessarily stick, in one way or another he helped many of the other artists of his time get their success, like David Lynch. He was a connector, he connected people. Also, he was ahead of the curve when it came to video art and mixing video and music. In the 70s and 80s, artists had begun to leave their usual neighborhoods and move to big warehouses just off Skid Row. Peter Ivers was one of them, alongside his girlfriend film exec Lucy Fisher. Around the same time, Peter and Fran Gold were writing songs for Diana Ross, Phyllis Hyman and the Pointer Sisters, cementing them as lucrative songwriters. Peter was creating music and had huge commercial success from multiple hit records, so when he was found dead on 3 March 1983, his friends, small fan base and the Hollywood community was shaken to its core. Harold Ramis's wife, Anne, was the first to raise the alarm. She'd been trying to get hold of her friend for hours, and after her calls to Peter went unanswered, she asked a neighbor to check on him. With the door usually unlocked, the neighbor could easily get into the loft and found Peter Ivers dead on his bed of the sixth floor apartment. He'd been attacked with a wooden hammer, and his cause of death would later be confirmed as enormous skull fractures and brain injury. He was only 36 years old. The investigation was mishandled from the start. The crime scene was immediately contaminated by the police and Peter's friends, who arrived on the rumors around town that the great Peter Ivers had died. The police had no idea what to do next, and Lucy Fisher recalled during the Los Angeles Times interview that Paul Michael Glazer, who played Starsky and Starsky and Hutch, arrived at the apartment, the police turned to him and said, what do we do? And he said, I'm an actor. The neighborhood didn't seem that concerned that someone had been murdered on their block. It was Skid Row, after all. It was also reported much later that the lock on the front door had been broken, but Lucy remembers it being unlocked. Peter's audio equipment was missing from his apartment, which led police to believe that an intruder had broken in and beaten the musician to death. The wooden hammer used to kill Peter had been left in the apartment, but had no fingerprints to pull. 
The police confirmed early that they had no suspects in the case, and despite detectives questioning Peter's friends, none of them appeared to have anything to do with it. Early on in the investigation, Lucy Fisher decided to hire a private investigator. However, it yielded similar results, and Lucy decided to close the investigation, telling you.com, I did continue on for close to a year. After a year, I decided I wasn't going to open that door anymore, the door to that room, because the room was a bad room. The police may not have had any suspects, but Peter's friends had their suspicions. Back in the early 80s, Peter was working on the New Wave Theater show on a small Los Angeles television station, KSCI. The program was a music-based TV show that included comedy and guest appearances. Over the years, the show had some big bands appear on it, including Dead Kennedys, The Plugs and Black Flag. Episodes can be found on YouTube. The brain behind the show was a man named Dave Jove, a producer and alleged acid dealer to the Rolling Stones, whose most recent career had skyrocketed because of New Wave Theater and Peter Ivers. But, according to Peter's friends, Jove was a violent drug abuser and didn't want Peter to leave the show due to his recent musical success. His furious outbursts had become vicious, and Peter's friends began to note the producer's temper. Dave Jove died in 2004, and Peter's case was all but forgotten. However, in 2006, the case was reviewed once more, and according to a detective in the homicide unit, there was one vague suspect. They came up with a suspect, who was a rooftop burglar who fell off a roof, as being the most likely suspect. I know there are a lot of people that think there's other people involved, but it doesn't appear that way. You would like to have better answers, but I don't think there ever will be. I think this is it. Peter Ivers' murder is now a cold case and resides in the Los Angeles Police Department's filing system, unlikely to be solved. As far as theories go, there are few. It all comes down to Dave Jover an intruder, according to numerous articles. He did not get his just desserts, Van Dyke Park said in an interview. That should not make me angry. But it sure does make me sad. However, Lucy Fisher believes the answer is simple, I do think it's possible that it was somebody crazy that he knew, she said. But I think it was also possible it was a passerby who had heard music coming out of there and knew. Equipment was stolen and the door was not locked. Peter could do everything except lock a door, basically. If Peter Ivers were alive today, he'd be 75 years old. The musician and his show, New Wave Theater, was the preamble to MTV and became the inspiration for bands across the world. His girlfriend, Lucy, played a big part in keeping Peter's voice and name alive over the years. She founded the Peter Ivers Visiting Artist Program at Harvard University not long after his death in 1983. The Guardian called him an Einstein among Neanderthals and the tragic prince of law counterculture, but there's nothing tragic about it. The fundamental point is that musician Peter Ivers was murdered, and no one has ever received justice for the crime. Number 3. Dorothy Scott worked as a secretary at the Swingers Psych Shop and Custom John's Head Shop in Anaheim, around five miles from her home in Stanton. The father of her four-year-old son Sean did not live locally, so it was her parents, Jacob and Vera who helped Dorothy with care for Sean while she was at work. Dorothy didn't dabble in drugs or alcohol. She preferred to stay home or go to church. She lived with her aunt and was close to her family. Dorothy was a devout Christian and seemed to be pursuing a quiet life. Sadly all that would come to a violent end. On May 28, 1980, heading home from an employee's meeting Dorothy noticed a strange raised bite on her co-worker's arm. Concerned she offered to drive him to the U.S. Irvine Medical Center. Their colleague Pam had offered to go with them. Around 9 p.m. that night, Dorothy drove first to her parents' home to quickly check on Sean and let her parents know she'd be late collecting him. While there she changed the black neck scarf she was wearing to a warmer red one. At the emergency room, the trio discovered that Conrad Bostron had been bitten by the killer black widow spider. He was given a prescription for treatment and discharged at 11 p.m. Dorothy left her two colleagues in the waiting room to go and collect her car and pick them up at the front door of the hospital. She was never seen again alive. As Conrad and Pam left the hospital to look for her, 
Dorothy's white station wagon flew towards them in the parking lot. The two waved their arms, trying to flag down the driver they took to be Dorothy, but the headlights were too bright for either of them to make out who was behind the wheel. The car turned right sharply out of the parking lot and disappeared from view. At first, the pair just assumed that Dorothy had rushed off to check on her son. But much later, after Conrad and Pam realized they hadn't heard from their close friend for several hours, the worried pair were forced to report her as missing. The following morning, Dorothy's car was found abandoned and burnt out in an alleyway, around 10 miles from the hospital. Police began working on the theory that Dorothy had been kidnapped. Prior to Dorothy's sudden disappearance, she had been receiving terrifying phone calls from a mystery caller. Dorothy herself often remarked that the male voice on the other end of the line seemed familiar to her, yet she never found out who exactly these calls were from. When I get you alone, I will cut you up into bits so no one will ever find you, threatened the disembodied voice down the phone line. This voice was a frequent caller, ringing Dorothy up almost every day and forcing police to take the extreme measure of installing an early voice recorder at the Scots house. The man always warned that he was watching her at all times, and one evening he demanded that Dorothy look outside, claiming to have left behind a gift for her. On the hood of her car was a single, dead rose. This morbid symbol terrified Dorothy, yet she had no clue as to the identity of the caller. In fact, according to Dorothy's mother, the brave secretary was so frightened by these persistent, chilling calls that she took up karate as self-defense against this mysterious stranger. And to this day, the caller remains a mystery. Maybe if we knew who was calling Dorothy, her murderer could be apprehended. Sadly, the caller and the killer remain at large. Back in 1980 when this crime happened, there was far less awareness of stalking and the danger such behavior poses, how it can escalate and build up to murder. Often stalking is not taken as seriously as it should be. Today we have much more research and understanding of stalkers and how their behaviors manifest. We also now know tragically just how many women who are murdered have been stalked by their killer beforehand. Dorothy's stalker was not known to be an ex-partner or an individual she had been in any form of relationship with. This man however was able to watch her, follow her and note her movements, her clothes, her location, all without seemly raising suspicions by those around him or being spotted by Dorothy herself. His phone calls suggest he had an obsession with Dorothy, he was in love with her. Obsession and fixation are key features of stalking behaviors and also the principal red flags for how much of a danger the stalker may be. The night Dorothy was snatched she was at the hospital with a colleague who had suffered a spider bite. A random event. At the work meeting when she noticed her colleague was unwell she offered to drive him to the hospital. This wasn't planned or scheduled yet her killer knew where she was, that she had stopped at her parents and changed her scarf. He was able to be there in the parking lot when she returned to her car in the dark with the intention of driving around to pick up her two colleagues at the front door. The killer could not have been planning to snatch her that night when she was with her colleagues. It may have been an opportunistic attack. He was following her, and when she arrived back at her car alone, he used that opportunity to strike. Two weeks after Dorothy vanished, her mystery caller found a new conversation partner. Are you related to Dorothy Scott? He first asked Dorothy's mother. Well, I've got her. From then on, every Wednesday, Whilst Dorothy's mother Vera was alone in the house, the phone would ring. According to Vera, the caller actually knew specific chilling details about Dorothy, he even knew what color her final scarf was. Was this caller really Dorothy's killer? The same man who had been taunting Dorothy down the phone for so many months? The police insisted that her parents revealed nothing in the press to compromise the case until Jacob cracked and contacted the local paper, the Orange County Register, to tell them about his daughter's case. The article on Dorothy's disappearance was published on June 12, 1980 and that same day, they too received a phone call. The caller told the register a previously completely unknown motive, he had murdered Dorothy because she was unfaithful to him. He claimed he was in love with Dorothy, but she had betrayed him with another man. He revealed details about Dorothy's disappearance that were never publicly known, such as her outfit on the evening she went missing. This caller, however, has never been identified. Customers to the head shop 
where Dorothy had worked were investigated, yet as she had worked in the office she had little to do with the often odd people that frequented swingers. The only lead was the caller, and although the police tried to trace the calls, the phone was always hung up before they could find out where the calls were coming from. These calls continued for four years, haunting the lives of Dorothy's parents. This was until April 1984 when Jacob, Dorothy's father, answered the phone. On hearing Jacob's voice the caller immediately hung up and didn't call back again for four months. Was the caller worried Dorothy's father would recognize his voice? On August 6, 1984, four years after Dorothy disappeared, her remains were discovered on a remote construction site. Dorothy's skull, pelvis, arm, and two thigh bones were found partially burnt. This gave investigators a timeline. Two years earlier in October 1982, there had been a fire at that location telling police Dorothy's remains had been there for at least that length of time. The discovery gave some closure to her family, although still no solution to the mystery of her death. In fact, the mystery was compounded by the discovery of the bones of a dog alongside Dorothy's remains. Some have suggested this points to an occult connection and strengthens the case against a suspect called Mike Butler, who lived in the local hills and held alternate religious beliefs. Butler was never strongly considered by the police, but sleuths have suggested that this local mechanic may have been the culprit. Also discovered with Dorothy's body was a turquoise ring that Dorothy's mother identified as belonging to Dorothy and a watch, which had stopped at 12.32 a.m., May 29, almost exactly an hour after Pam and Conrad last saw Dorothy's wagon speeding off. Just days after the discovery of Dorothy's remains, the mystery calls restarted to her parents' home. Once again the caller would ask if Dorothy was home when Vera answered the phone. Dorothy's family held a memorial service on August 22, 1984, her parents finally able to lay their daughter to rest. Haunted for years by a cold-blooded caller, Dorothy's parents never knew who killed their child. Jacob Scott died in 1994. Dorothy's mother Vera passed away in 2002. The phone calls this killer transferred to Dorothy's grieving parents were taunting and cruel. Dorothy's son has grown up without ever knowing what happened to his mother or why. This unknown stalker who had terrorized Dorothy in the months before he abducted and murdered her is still out there. An individual who has never faced justice for taking an innocent life and leaving behind devastating grief and a lifetime of unanswered questions. Number 4. 52 year old Jacob Bornkamp, known as Jock, was precisely where he wanted to be in life. The Dutch native was creating stunning flower displays for the royal family and nobility, and he was in a relationship with the man he loved. He once picked us up at the airport wearing snake leather boots, camo trousers and a big white fur coat. Jop was not your regular florist. Heljert Bose, Jop's nephew told us. In 1967, Jop had moved from Rotterdam to London to pursue his career in floristry. The 19-year-old found work at Pulbrook and Gould, whose clients included aristocracy and politicians, including Margaret Thatcher. At 32, Jop met Danny, and the pair eventually started their own florist in London, where he created arrangements for the Queen. On 6 September 1997, his flowers filled Westminster Abbey for Princess Diana's funeral. On 4 June 2000, Jop and his friend, Richard, were walking through New Cross, London, after leaving the 24-hour gay sauna, 309. It was around 7 a.m. when two stocky men walked past the pair. They stopped and assaulted Jop and his friend in an unprovoked attack. Jop was stabbed in the heart and succumbed to his injuries in Lewisham Hospital a few hours later, while Richard survived. The attack was treated as homophobic and the investigation started quickly. The CCTV footage that investigators obtained was of poor quality, and with NASA's help to sharpen the video, two men were later arrested but were released without charge. The man and cyclist who stopped to help the victims were also never identified. The case was included on the UK's Crime Watch program twice. It received a lot of media attention due to the nature of the crime and Jop's relationship to the royal family, but two years later, and there were still no developments in the case. We have been unable to establish a clear motive, but we are treating it as a homophobic crime. 
We hope to make a breakthrough this year. Maybe loyalties have changed, and the other man, who did not stab Jop, could now come forward. Detective Inspector Julian Wired in a 2002 interview in News Shopper. The murder was described in a 2007 report written by the independent lesbian gay bisexual transgender advisory group as a turning point for the relationship between the police and London's gay community. The report read, there were several investigations where we have deep reservations about the way in which the identity of the victim informed investigative decisions at the time. We also found evidence of inappropriate attitudes to the circumstances of some murders. Jop's murder was included in the report as one of the five unsolved murders that had a fragmented inquiry to solve it. Jop's partner Danny even offered a £20,000 reward for any information leading to the identity of the two assailants, but the incentive remained unclaimed. Danny wrote to the Prime Minister, Tony Blair, who was still in office, asking to him review and revise the Criminal Injuries Compensation Authority scheme, which only paid compensation to same-sex couples. Stonewall, an LGBT rights charity, was already speaking to the Prime Minister and campaigning loudly about the SICA rules. Just a year before, the bombing at the Admiral Duncan pub had occurred, and it highlighted the unfairness of the ruling when the husband of a pregnant woman who was killed received compensation. Still, the partners of the men who died didn't receive anything from the scheme. In 2001, the Criminal Injuries Compensation Authority's rules were amended, allowing partners in same-sex relationships to receive payouts. Danny became the first gay man to receive compensation from the scheme. Marriage wasn't available to me and Jop then, but I would definitely have gone for that. I knew that we would be together for life. It's been a huge loss for me, and I miss him awfully. I had a bad time when it happened, it was like a nightmare. Danny told us. Jop Bornkamp was buried at Beckenham Cemetery and Crematorium in London. His grave is guarded by a stone Great Dane. The Metropolitan Police say that the case is still open and is reviewed periodically. Anyone with information regarding Jacob Bornkamp's murder should contact the incident room on 02082176461 or Crimes Toppers on 0800555111.